It's put up or shut up time for the Seahawks 2021 draft class. What can the Seahawks expect from D. Eskridge, Trey Brown, and company in 2023? I'm going to be breaking it all down in our latest Blue Friday installment of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks. Your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, the host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. A special thanks to all the 12s out there as always for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We're drawing close to the start of OTAs. The Seahawks will kick off the festivities next Monday at the VMAC. Not all their veterans are going to be coming out for the party, but a lot of players will be returning along with the incoming rookie class, some second-year players as well. Most of the roster will be there to participate in organized team activities, mandatory minicamp coming up soon as well. So keeping that in mind on today's episode, going to be shifting to Forecast Friday, a new segment we're going to be breaking out every week, taking a look at one or two players a week at last year in review and projections for the upcoming season. And today I'm going to be tackling your questions on a special Blue Friday mailbag. Without further ado, let's get to the episode. Now for your lead story here on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. When it comes to assessing a draft class, it can take several seasons to really truly be able to evaluate what kind of impact the players have had on a football team. In the case of the Seahawks with their 2021 draft class, now, the early returns have not been so positive, in large part because of injuries. Second-round pick D. Eskridge has missed seven games in each of his first two seasons. And Trey Brown, their fourth-round pick out of Oklahoma, while he played well in a limited action his rookie season, missed most of that year with a knee injury and missed most of last season when he returned, was not able to get into the lineup defensively for very many snaps with Mike Jackson and Tariq Woolen in front of him. And so the top two draft picks have not done much, and they've been outside line with injuries frequently. Stone Forsythe, their sixth-round pick, the third and final pick, easily the smallest draft class in John Schneider's tenure in Seattle, has been solid when he's had his opportunities. But the additions of Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas last year put him in a spot where without injuries, he is going to be your swing tackle that can play left or right tackle, not going to be a starter but he can step in and play for you when needed. And he was able to do that. Played pretty solid in one spot start, got a few other snaps and a couple other games. And so he's been fairly solid as a sixth round pick. But looking towards the 2023 season, this truly is a critical year for D. Eskridge and Trey Brown because they really are in a situation where both their position groups have had reinforcements added. And even though they're only in year three, they were – going to potentially be pushed out because of the high draft picks the Seahawks invested at their respective positions. And I think you've got to start with D. Eskridge with this discussion because when Seattle picked him in the second round, 2021, the expectation is that he was going to be that complimentary target that was going to take pressure off Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf underneath, create after the catch. He was going to be that jet sweep magnet that Sean McVay has used with the Rams. Shane Waldron's going to use in the same way. And things just have not worked out. Even when D. Eskridge has been healthy, which has not been often, the production has been very limited for him in his first two seasons. 17 total catches for 122 yards, just one touchdown. Most of that production came in one game against the San Francisco 49ers during his rookie season. He's averaged under seven and a half yards per catch. I guess the good news, he hasn't had any drops, but he also hasn't had any explosives. And it's really been a difficult situation for D. Eskridge because when he has been on the field, it has felt like the Seahawks have tried to force the issue a little bit. Getting the football into his hands in the run game rather than making those plays organically happen. And he's been so hit and miss in terms of whether he shows up in the receiving game. There have been a few games where there's been flashes, that 49ers one being notable. On special teams, he hasn't been able to produce much when he's had opportunities as a kick returner. There were a few, but again, it all comes 
as far as reasons for optimism when you're looking at the Seahawks squad, from an optimistic standpoint for Eskridge, he's still a phenomenal athlete. This is a guy that ran in the four threes. He's still a young player, was a little older coming in as a rookie, but he's still only in his third year. And he's going to bring a lot of those tools to the table that the Seahawks have been looking for as far as creating after the catch. He can win downfield. He's got the vertical threat capabilities. That stuff is still there if he can just stay healthy and stay in a rhythm. And without Godwin Igabuke being brought back, at least to this point, there's a big hole on special teams returning kicks and punts. And so D. Eskridge could fill that in for the Seahawks as well. But there's not much reason for optimism when you're really looking at it because the addition of Jackson Smith and Jigba, he's supposed to fill all those roles that D. Eskridge was originally drafted to take care of, to play in the slot, to create after the catch, to be a weapon in the short to intermediate game, be a savvy route runner. All of those were attributes, even though Eskridge is a little different athlete, not quite as quick, he's faster, but he does a lot of the things that Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be bringing to the Seahawks offense. So I'm just wondering where the snaps are going to come for him here. If there's an injury, then obviously that opens the door for him to get more snaps. But with the tight end depth, the Seahawks have the talent in that position. I just don't know how much you're going to be seeing them in four receiver sets. And he'll get his chances to rotate in because Smith and Jigba Lockett and Metcalf are not going to play every single snap at receiver, but you're going to have to deal with Dariq Young too, a second year target that showed some flashes late last year. So it's not necessarily guaranteed that he's going to be your number four guy. They got an undrafted rookie in Matt Landers that they like. And so odds are working against Eskridge right now, especially with that pick of Jackson Smith and Jigba. Could he still be a factor in this offense? Sure. But I think his best chance to have an impact this year is on special teams and looking back at the chance they had to get Creed Humphrey and some of the other players that were available, it just makes the pick look worse at this point. You're hoping that he can stay healthy and give you some contributions on offense. Trey Brown, I think, has a little better chance to maybe find his way into the lineup. When you look at his numbers when he's played, he has been productive. His rookie year, he had a handful of starts. He played in five games. Completion percentage against him under 50%. QB rating below 70, so he was effective. He had a couple fourth down stops that he made. He showed that he could come up and hit people. The one that still jumps out to me is the hit on Ray-Ray McLeod against the Steelers in Pittsburgh in primetime in overtime that forced the Steelers to punt. It was third and three, went up and absolutely blasted the receiver. So we have seen really solid play from him, but he tore his patellar tendon, had to have surgery, missed a good chunk of last season, came back mid, mid-year, mid wasn't able to get into the lineup because Mike Jackson was playing well. There was really nowhere to put. The reason that I could see Trey Brown potentially factoring into Seattle's defense still, with Devin Witherspoon and Tariq Woolen being your outside corners, I don't see him playing on the boundary. He's going to be your depth guy at one of those spots with Mike Jackson being at the other position most likely. But because Trey Brown is a shorter, smaller, quicker corner that plays an aggressive brand of football, I still think he could be a good fit playing in the slot. And Kobe Bryant played there last year. Julian loved the free agent addition. He's a safety, but he's also played a lot of snaps in the slot. So there's going to be a competition coming up at that position. Kobe Bryant maybe has the edge going in because he did get better throughout his rookie season. He forced four fumbles. But he is not the same athlete that Trey Brown is in terms of change of direction and quickness. And I think that lends itself better to the position, especially with some of the receivers you're going to be playing reduced inside in the NFC West and really the conference in general. And so if he's able to show that he is fully healthy, he's not going to be most likely competing on the outside with the talent the Seahawks have in the boundary spots. But I could see him if he can put everything together and play like he did before his injuries rookie season and the Seahawks give him a shot in the slot. I would not be surprised if he finds a way to win that spot. And so in that case, the Seahawks would get some really good value once again from a former fourth-round pick. But this is a really small draft class. The injuries have held both these players back, especially Eskridge. With the additions that they have made at corner and receiver, I just don't know necessarily that you're going to be seeing a major impact from those guys. And if you don't get that this season, they don't take a big step forward. It's pretty safe to say at this point that – That draft class, it was small to begin with, made it tougher for them to be able to add key contributors with the Jamal Adams trade, some of the other trades that they made, adding veteran talent. I think it's safe to say that that draft class has not panned out for the Seahawks 
to this point. Coming up next, I'm going to answer your questions in our weekly mailbag segment. Tons of questions on Twitter as well as YouTube. I'll be tackling those here in a moment on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious snack but don't want all the sugar and calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar, the Built Bar. You got to try it. Covered in 100% real chocolate, amazing flavors including churro, peanut butter, brownie, cookies, and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while having amazing macros. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't have to wait at home to get a box. For years, we've been telling you to order Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club, and you can still get your specialty flavors at Built.com. That's right. Head on over to your nearest Walmart, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate bar, or coconut puff. And if you're close to Sam's Club, you can run in and get a 13-bar box with other hit flavors, such as brownie batter puff and churro puff, you can thank me later. You're listening to the Blue Friday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you are listening in nearby Idaho or you're across the country listening from Boston, Massachusetts. We greatly appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to make Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Every day, we're going to be taking a look at what to watch in OTAs when Rob Rang and I reconvene for our Monday episode. You won't want to miss it. We'll be looking at both sides of the football and maybe even a little bit of special teams as well. Let's get to our mailbag. We haven't had one for a couple weeks because it's been pretty crazy with Rookie Minicamp and all the awesome guests that we were able to have on the show this week. So without further ado, let's get to your questions. The first one coming from Mitchell Bonner. He tweets, I know he's been inconsistently good over the past few seasons, but do you think Daryl Taylor takes the step up this year and becomes dominant? I could certainly see it happening. What's really held him back is the lack of run defense, the inability to set the edge. And last year we saw the Seahawks had to do with Daryl Taylor. He opened the year as a starter. There were some flashy plays rushing the passer, but teams were purposely running the football at him. And whether it was him messing up his gap responsibility or getting blocked out of the play, he kept finding himself on the wrong end on those run plays. And teams were gashing the Seahawks to the direction of the field that he was at. And so they had to replace him. Daryl Johnson started a game, and eventually Boya Mafe was starting games for the Seahawks. So I don't know where he necessarily fits into that rotation in terms of being a starter or a backup. The way he finished the year last year rushing the passer, he looked like a starter, but they were using him more as a situational rusher, and maybe that ends up being his ceiling that he's a really good situational rusher. But Pete Carroll has been talking about the extra muscle he's added, how good he looks. We'll get a chance to see him on the field here in the near future and try to pinpoint where he's going to be at. But this is really his third season. He missed his rookie year due to injury, so this may be the time for him to really take that next big step. And he's going to be a restricted free agent next year. Seattle's going to have a little bit more flexibility getting him back next season because he missed that rookie year with an injury. So this is a big year for him. And you could consider him being part of that 2021 class if you want because of the injury that he had. But this is an opportunity for him to show that he can make strides defending the run because as long as that's a liability, it's going to limit how much he can be on the field. If he makes major strides there with what we've seen from him as a pass rusher, then he has a chance to have a big 2023 season. Phil Weidick tweets, what will Kenny McIntosh need to show in camp to become the consistent third down back? This really boils down to two things in my mind. The pass catching, which we know that he's got really soft hands, and the pass protection. The film is good at Georgia, and he's playing top competition in the SEC, but that can be a slippery slope for a running back, especially a, a player like McIntosh that isn't quite as big as the other running backs they all drafted, Zach Charbonnet. He's a little smaller even than Ken Walker the third. Walker had his struggles last year in pass protection. That was not a strength for him in college is going to have is something that relates to the NFL. There have been plenty of examples of guys that were good pass pro artists in the backfield in college, and then there were some growing pains in the NFL. So you got to see where he fits in when the pads come on in pass protection and the pass catching. How does he fit into the offense? Do they move him around some to the slot? If he's able to do that as he did at Georgia, I think it gives him an inside track because that's something 
as much as DJ Dallas has some value with his pass protection and his receiving ability, he's not the same player moving outside to the slot and having formational flexibility that McIntosh could potentially be for the Seahawks. So those are the two things I'm watching. Obviously, running the football is always key with these guys. But when you're talking about a third down back, the pass protection stuff is critical. That's what got Travis Homer on the field as much as it did when he was healthy. That is really going to be the one thing that I'm zeroed in on when we look at training camp as well as the preseason. Next question coming from a Foxer one tweets, do backup tackles Greg Island or Jalen McKenzie have any shot of making the final roster behind Jake Curhan and Stone Forsyth? Or would Anthony Bradford be our emergency third string tackle? I think it would require an injury for one of those guys to make this football team. At this stage, Island's been with the team. This is now his third year in Seattle. Find it hard to believe that he is going to get over the hump and make the roster with Jake Curhan and Stone Forsyth being the backups. I don't see Seattle carrying more than four tackles anyway, so it's going to be tough sledding for those two guys. They'll be on the roster, maybe practice squad guys again, but hard to envision they're going to be making this team without there being a significant injury on the depth chart. And if they did end up in a spot where multiple injuries happened and They were down to an emergency. Then Bradford did show last year that he could play tackle in a pinch. And the Seahawks have a couple other players on their offensive line that they could potentially do that with too. But I would think Bradford would probably be first in line because of his athleticism, the fact that he has played there against SEC competition for one start. Henry T tweets, if you have a connection in the medical world, realistically speaking, can Jamal Adams get back to 100%? If so, what's the timeline? So, I'm not going to pretend that I'm a doctor, Henry. There's a reason that I do podcasting and reporting, and I'm not a doctor. So uh, the thing is, though, those of you that have listened to this podcast regularly, and we will be having a new episode coming up soon with my mother jumping on with our yearly schedule rankings for quarterbacks. That's going to be coming up soon. But my mom is a doctor, so I do have a little bit of background on some of these injuries. And I've actually talked to her about a torn quad tendon like the one that Jamal Adams had. So This is what you need to know. This is a very tricky injury to come back from, but there's actually a decent recovery rate. And it's not an injury that happens a lot. It's a fairly rare injury. The biggest issue is the timetable. And Seattle's been kicking around the idea maybe that he would be ready for training camp. And that would put him almost to a year. The injury happened in week one last year in September. So I don't know if he's going to be quite ready to come back at that point. And even if he is, I don't know if he's going to be to the point where he's his Jamal Adams of old necessarily. He could still get back there, but it might take longer than just when he is available and healthy enough to play for him to play at that level. And there are some examples out there in other sports. Victor Oladipo, those of you that watch the NBA, he has never been the same player since he had that injury with the Indiana Pacers. He's played for a bunch of different teams. Has never been that all-star caliber player again. But there's an example of guys that have had this injury in the past in multiple sports that have been able to come back to full form too. So I would say that there's a good chance that's going to happen, but timeline is really the trickiest part because this is truly one of those injuries that can take a year or more for a guy to really get back to their pre-injury form. and They might not quite get to that point either. So that's what makes this a difficult situation to assess with Jamal Adams. Little Billy on YouTube writes, is this finally the season we get our running back screen game functioning at an NFL level? So from a running back perspective, you would think because Charbonnet's got experience doing that. Kenny McIntosh is dynamic in the screen game. And even Ken Walker III, all three of those guys have the ability to get the job done on screens. But there's so much more to that type of a play than just having running backs that can catch the ball and create after the catch. It is something that you really have to be meticulous practicing in terms of timing, getting your linemen out to get blocks at the second level, the way that the quarterback executes the play. And it's just been one of those things. It almost feels like it's been cursed for the Seahawks, that they have not been able. It hasn't matter who's the coach. It hasn't matter who's the offensive coordinator. They've just consistently struggled as a franchise to be able to run screens effectively. So, You can only hope that this year they're going to be able to get over the hump there. They've got the players to do it at running back. They've got some good athletes in the offensive line that can get out and make those blocks. But quite frankly, until I see it consistently being done on the field, uh, I'm going to be a bit skeptical on this one, unfortunately. 
Jace tweets, I know you've been critical of the defensive line, but don't you feel like the fresh wave of young talent and investments will be at least a moderate improvement? I just don't think it's as big of a need as we think. And that may be the case. The issue here is that you're really looking at a boomer bust factor because if players like Cameron Young and Mike Morris are able to come in and they're able to contribute right away and some of your other veterans step up, Jaron Reed returns to prior form, better than he was last year in Green Bay. I mean, there's a lot of ifs there, though, and you're putting a lot on the shoulders of these rookies coming in. I mean, Mike Morris has not played a lot of snaps reduced inside at Michigan. At least last year didn't play a lot there. Cameron Young has not played this traditional no spot, although I think his skill set is better catered to do this than what Mississippi State was having him do in an aggressive slanting front for the Bulldogs the last couple of years. You're just putting a lot of weight on their shoulders. And this is a position where you can do that with rookies a little bit easier, especially nose tackle. That is a spot where young guys can typically come in and handle their duties more effectively than a lot of other positions. But still, I just think there is a lot of boomer bust here. This group could certainly be better. The additions of Draymond Jones bringing back Jaron Reed, some of the veterans they've added at nose tackle that maybe can rotate in there at least during training camp. I mean, there's some intrigue there, but you lost so much experience and players like Puna Ford and Al Woods, who up to last year, I mean, Al Woods still had a pretty good year, but up to last year, a number of those guys were really good run defenders. And so they've got a lot of pieces to replace and they've got a lot of uncertainty there. And I think that's why there's some hesitancy by me and, and by some other people looking at that defensive line. But I think there's upside. We'll just have to wait and see. Patrick O'Brien tweets, do you think Vi Jones will get more playing time this year? I thought he had an impressive preseason last season. He did. He played really well, and he's also added an additional 10 pounds of muscle, which I think was the biggest issue that he had working against him. He was tall and skinny. He is still a lean linebacker, but he looks more like an off-ball middle linebacker in the NFL now. Really good athlete, had good sack production in college, finishing his career up at NC State. Really a great special teams player. So that might be what helps him get one of the final spots in the 53-man roster. With Bobby Wagner coming back, Devin Bush signing, the chance Jordan Brooks is ready for week one, looking more and more likely at this point. I don't know that he can get on this roster by his defensive accolades, but special teams is what gives him a chance to make this football team. And he's still a really intriguing developmental guy that they can work behind Wagner, Bush, and a healthy Brooks. A couple of those guys are going to be free agents after this year. All three of those guys are scheduled to be free agents, actually, after this year. So a player like Vi Jones, you want to keep close tabs on him for 2024 and beyond is a guy that maybe could play his way into a role with this football team still as a defender and on special teams. Andrea Springer on YouTube in all the hype around Julian Love and the physical traits of Jarek Reed the second. What is Joey Blunt's status coming back from injury? Has he gone from an ascending player to fighting for a roster spot? So I think he is right on the borderline between those two things. I think there's still potential for him and you hear what the coaches said last year. Players like Quandre Diggs really were impressed with what he did last season. And so I don't think you should forget about him. But bringing in Jarek Reed and Julian Love now puts a lot of pressure on his shoulders to be able to make this team. And he was a really good special teams player last year, just like Vice Jones. That would be his calling card to being able to stick on this roster. But adding that draft pick and adding a marquee free agent addition like a Julian Love, they can play all over the field. You've got Jamal Adams coming back. Quandre Diggs is still there. They could maybe keep all five of those guys on the roster because of special teams' value and some of the injuries they've had. But it's going to be tricky. So I would put him right on that bubble line where he's still a guy that could be an ascending talent, maybe play some on defense for you down the line. But the additions that they have made at both safety spots now – make it a lot tougher of a challenge for him to be able to hang around long-term in the secondary. Last question here coming from Chris Martinson on YouTube. What do you think the nickel defense will play more, two safety, three corners, or three safety and two corners? Well, if it goes how the Seahawks want it to go, and it to this point has not because Jamal Adams mainly has had the injury issues, but if they can keep Adams healthy with digs and love, that is going to be the trio that is on the field the vast majority of the time. If you have all three of those players healthy, I think they're going to be above a 60% threshold where all three of them are on the field together. I think that's going to become the base package for this defense. Of course, 
You look at Jamal Adams' durability history, might be difficult for the Seahawks to meet that goal. And in that case, Kobe Bryant or Trey Brown could come in as a nickel, uh, play the slot corner position, and then you could have some three cornerback looks. But I think right now, this this is going to be a defense that's leaning heavily on those three safety looks. That's what they want to do, at least. All right, let's switch gears here on our Blue Friday edition of Locked on Seahawks. Going to be busting out a brand new segment on Fridays from here on out through the rest of the offseason. And I always think it's worthwhile to look back at the seasons that players had the year before. So this is going to exclude rookies from this. But introducing forecast Friday and how this is going to work. We're going to look back and review the season prior for returning veterans for the Seahawks, maybe even some of their free agent additions as well that played with other teams. And then I'm going to try to project what they're going to do in 2023. Now, one disclaimer here, I am going to be excluding injuries during this because those are near impossible to predict. There are guys that are more injury prone, that have more of a history, and you can bet they're going to miss some time. But at the same time, it's difficult. So all the projections I make are going to be based off of a 17-game schedule, that that player plays all 17 games. So to start this series, I was talking about the presence of Jackson Smith and Jigba earlier in this show and how that's going to put pressure on D. Eskridge. Let's stay at the receiver position with DK Metcalf, who hard to believe he's still only 25 years old going into his fifth season with the Seahawks. Looking back at the season that he had a year ago, a couple positives as far as far as what went right for number 14. He had a career high in receptions with 90 catches his first year playing with full-time starter Geno Smith and a 63.8% catch rate that was the second best catch rate of his career only two years earlier where he was a hair over 64 percent was just a teeny bit better it was his second season with a thousand or more yards in his four-year NFL career and he tied for six in the NFL with four touchdowns of 20 plus yards so he was still a lethal target down the field even without Russell Wilson who had been known for throwing those rainbow passes downfield Geno Smith kept that rolling especially as the year progressed last season As far as what didn't go well for DK, I think this is the first thing that really jumped out to me. He only caught nine out of 27 targets on deep patterns of 20 plus yards. And some of that is on Geno Smith. There were a few missed throws, but more times than not, it was simply on the receiver not being able to get the catch. He did have two drops and he only won three contested catches on 10 attempts on downfield throws. So that was a bit of a struggle compared to earlier in his career. He also averaged a career worst 11.6 yards per reception. So under 12 yards per catch. Some of that was the emphasis on the short to intermediate game early in the year. He also created the fewest yards after the catch and fewest missed tackles forced last season. And so I think when you look at those numbers, under 250 yards after the catch created, a lot of that is based on the play caller, and Seattle still relies heavily on Metcalf to win downfield. Vertical threat receivers like that are not going to create as many yards after the catch because they're catching bombs downfield. At the same time, a 230-pound receiver with the athletic tools that DK Metcalf has, you would think you would want to find ways to get the football into his hand on screens and be able to successfully run those so you can get him one-on-one with defenders, break tackles, and rack up yak yardage. That just has not happened in his four seasons, and a lot of that goes back to a topic I touched on earlier. The Seahawks have not been able to consistently run screens at a high level, so they have struggled as a team to create yards after the catch. So Metcalf was just part of that equation a year ago in 2022, As far as the 11.6 yards per reception goes, all those missed opportunities on downfield passes, if he catches a couple more of those, that number is going to jump up significantly. So I don't expect that's going to keep tilting down. This is the third straight year, actually, that his yards per reception went down, but he's caught more passes and more short to intermediate routes, which is going to naturally bring those numbers down, especially if you're not creating yards after the catch. As far as areas that he needs to improve the most, I don't know that you can necessarily put the yards after catch on him again. A lot of that goes back to the play calling, the ability to run screen, 
that you hear about some of the focus drops that happen with DK Metcalf. He had five drops last year, according to Pro Football Focus, two of those being on deep patterns. And it just seems like they come at the worst times a lot of the time, too. And so he's still working on trying to improve there. He's still working on trying to further sharpen his route running skills. He's come a long way since his rookie year coming out of Ole Miss, but he is still not necessarily a refined route runner compared to some of his peers. And so that's an area he's going to continue to tackle as far as what I expect to see from him in 2023. This has a chance to be a year where he could potentially break out, so to speak. We could see some career numbers from him because Geno Smith is going to be in his second year as the starter. This is going to be the first time in Geno's career. He's been with the same offensive coordinator for two seasons as a starter. He's got all these weapons around him that are going to take pressure off of DK Metcalf, especially Jackson Smith and Jigba. I view this as a double-edged sword. On one hand, his ability to win in the middle of the field as a slot receiver that is going to make it tougher for defenses to really pin all their attention on Metcalf and Lockett. So you've got to believe that there's going to be a few more opportunities to win downfield. But when you're looking at numbers like receptions, Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to get his share of catches. He's going to have a lot of opportunities to have the football in his hands. There's only one football to go around and Lockett's going to get his catches too. And so I'm looking at it this way for 2023. And again, this is based on a 17-game sample. This is assuming DK Metcalf plays in every single game. I don't think he gets back to 90 receptions like he had last year. I don't think he's going to be far below that, but I'm going to go with 83 because some of those catches are going to go to Jackson Smith and Jigba. The rookie is going to get plenty of opportunities working from the slot. I think Tyler Lockett is going to lose some of his reception production too, and your tight ends might lose a few because, again, there's only one football to go around. But I expect the yards per reception is going to jump back up into the 13 to 14 range. In this case, I have him going for 1,170 yards, 14.1 yards per catch, and 12 explosives. Last year, he only had nine of those such catches of 20-plus yards. I think you see a few more of those with things being opened up some by Jackson Smith and Jigba's presence, having Tyler Lockett still there as well. Drops, he's been pretty consistent with four to five or more than that every season. I'm just not necessarily sold at this point that we're going to see those completely eliminated from the equation. But where I do see him boosting his numbers this year, I see more receptions, uh, more yards per reception. I see more explosive receptions of 20 plus yards. And I think he's going to find the end zone more. In year two, with Gino as the starter, Jackson Smith and Jigba's presence again there, I think in the red zone, it's going to create some of those prime one-on-one opportunities for DK Metcalf. We saw him score more touchdowns later as the year progressed last season. I think that that carries over into this year. And I think you'll see a bit more yards after the catch from him as well. And so I think it's a chance for him in a number of different areas to improve upon last year's numbers. I just think adding another dynamic receiver to the fold is naturally going to take away some of those opportunities for him. So I don't know that we see that breakout year statistically across the board, but there could be some areas where having Jackson Smith and Jigba does improve his yards per reception, improves the number of touchdowns that he has, the number of explosives downfield. Those are the kind of things I think that we could see an uptick from this year. I just don't see the overall reception numbers, and I don't see him exploding for 1,400, 1,500 yards with the other weapons the Seahawks have. There's just not going to be enough throws there. They're going to run the ball more than they did last year, I think, too. Those factors in consideration, I think DK has a chance to have a really good season. I just don't know what the other weapons they have that he is going to have the chance to have one of those all-pro caliber seasons that we see some of these other really elite receivers in the NFL having. There's just too many mouths to feed in this offense. It's a good problem to have, and DK Metcalf isn't going to be selfish in that regard. He obviously wants the football, but I think this is a chance for him to have another really strong season, but this is a case where the supporting cast could hold him back a little bit from truly having that career year statistically. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. Subscribe and follow Locked On Seahawks on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. When we come back on Monday, I'll be rejoined by Rob Rang, and the two of us will be previewing OTAs, what to watch on offense and defense as Seattle moves into the final phase of the off-season program. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. Go Hawks.